right. Good morning, Laura. Welcome to Firm and Final. How are you doing? Good morning, ma'am. Doing well. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us for this discussion. And Laura, you and I don't know each other all that well. We don't. Um, but we were introduced by Aaron Duffy, and we have another connection in common, Lucy Carter. And they both have told me that you're doing a lot of work in the space, specifically around helping women get more entrenched into the reinsurance industry. I found that to be really fascinating because I got two young girls at home and I want to make sure that they have all the opportunities ahead of them in whatever industry that they want to pursue. So I'm curious right off the bat, if you could tell us what it is that you're doing specifically with your women's networking group. Sure. You're jumping right in. Love it. Yeah. Um, So this was kind of a brainchild, I would say back in 2021. So I started, this will answer one of my probably questions later, but started in the industry in 2011 at 22 years old. And very quickly, I started to see at, at conferences just how many friendships there were out there. Um, a lot of them were you know, male friendships that they had built over the years, and they really valued those friendships inside of their industry, but then outside too. They would go golfing together in their personal yeah. time and... Um, you know, that's, I noticed that that's how the best deals were done were through really great friendships, trusted, trusted people in the industry, um, to get things done with. So over, over the years, I was like, okay, where, where is my place in that? I'm 22 years old. There's not a lot of 22 year olds at these conferences trying to fit into a, a mold that maybe I, I didn't fit into a ton, you know, 10, 11, 12 years in at this point, And I'm saying, okay, I want to connect with with more women. I, I haven't had a chance to, you know, mm-hmm. the conferences, it's so busy. Here are meetings and meetings and you go to your dinner and then you're on to the it's next chaotic. thing. It's a little chaotic. And yeah. so it's hard to really take the time to build those connections and friendships. You know, it's great to have um, just general connections, but you don't get the chance to go deep with somebody and really understand who they are as a person. And yes. So, yeah, I just found that there wasn't enough of a forum for females specifically to be able to build community and support each other. Um, so I just, I started to kind of brainstorm on what that might look like. And it's still an evolving thing, but we've done two years now. So there was one in 2022 and then I had a child late yeah. 2022. So it postponed the second one to sure. early this year. We went to New Orleans in January of 2024. Um, and then there's been about 12 women uh, on the trip. We're trying to keep it under about 15. Okay. Uh, But this is a really great group of women. We come together and these are all people that aren't new necessarily in the industry. You know, they've, they've been around for a little while, but they're not on their way out. They still have a lot of runway ahead of them and doing some really cool things. Um, And so we all kind of came together, not only just to, to build community and connections, but to learn from each other. You know, everyone has a lot of expertise in our space in various areas so it was just so cool. We we had you know an actuary from a reinsurance company there, and uh, Aaron who's doing RBP, and they were able to learn from each other on what, what each other are doing, what you're seeing in the market, and yeah. Um, and now we're on a text thread together where we you know cheers to each other on you know cool advancements in our careers, and and these I, are probably some of your competitors that are part of the group as well. Uh, there's some competitors for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's hard not to have some of that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a couple, you, you end up becoming friends with your competitors. I've seen it. Like, yeah. I, oh, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be out with a retail broker and there'll be another retail broker and they're as close friends, even though they're trying to eat each other's lunch. You know what I mean? Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. But you can't have that perspective that, oh, if it's a competitor, I don't want to talk to them or be near them. It's too right. small of an industry. You know, and like we're talking about, it's a very people forward industry. Relationships matter. You don't want to burn bridges. You know, it's, I think it's just important to be open to, to anyone and everyone at this point. I will say there's no reinsurance brokers on my trip. <laughs> All right. I never say never, but uh, yeah. the last few years there, there haven't been, but yes. Sure. So, there's definitely, yeah. Yes. I think the industry has changed so much that um, there's, there's, individuals that could be your competitor, but at the same time, they could be a business partner as well. Sure. It's just, there's people that are working in so many different facets of the industry that you look at one side and say, okay, we can partner there. And at the same frame, you may be a foe. 
and that's okay. It's just you live in this ecosystem where sometimes you have opportunities to do things together, and sometimes you just say, okay, I'm not going to do business here because that's too much of a conflict of interest. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope to do business with Lucy someday, right? She's yeah. She's also a reinsurance broker. She works with the Lloyd's uh, syndicates and I don't work with the Lloyd's syndicates. So sure. I might have an opportunity where I need to, Lucy to help me with the Lloyd's market. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so how is the women's networking group going? Like, what do you feel like is the goal that you want to achieve with it? You know, again, it's an evolving thing. I'm learning every year. Uh, yeah. ways to tweak it and what makes sense and getting feedback from the group on how they felt it went, what they feel like is the appropriate way to approach it next year. So I'm sending out a survey here in May and I will, you know, collect more information for how this will look next year. Awesome. But I'm just so happy with even how it's evolved in the last two years of doing it. Um, got a lot of great feedback right after the trip from the women that they just felt like they really met good humans who they feel like they've got this safety net now of people that they can lean on. You know, you talk a lot about mentorship and, you know, it's great to have one mentor, but to have a, a group of 10 to 15 women that you can lean on yes. when, when you need them, or again, just like Alita Nazenzo, she just got promoted to CEO of, of Fairco and she sent out a message to the group and we all, you know, congratulated her and, and told her that we're here to support her in any, any way she needs. And, you know, she felt like having women around her really got her to the point of feeling like she could take on a role like this. That's awesome. I I love seeing that type of fellowship and and you need that fellowship and in other places too, right? It's not just professionally, but I think that that's great. and, And I give you kudos for all the work you're doing there. But for the background of the audience, tell everybody where you work today and what your role is. So I work for a company called Risk Strategies. Uh, we are about a 5,000 plus employee shop now. We've grown a ton since, I would say, 2015. Uh, we've been acquiring lots of uh, smaller entities, entrepreneurial yeah. companies. I would call us uh, primarily a specialty retail broker shop. However, I work within the reinsurance arm of our national healthcare practice. Okay. So we're a little bit of the black sheep where we are the reinsurance brokers rather than on the retail side. And we focus on anything A and H, um, so all, all accident health lines, anything from uh, managed care business, ACOs, health plans to MGU business, carrier business, um, yeah, a lot of program business, bringing parties together, and then placing excess and quarter share reinsurance behind it. So, and so, how did you get to risk strategies? Like, what what was your kind of like career steps to get to where you are today? Yeah, a little different than some of the other people. There's a lot of people in our industry that had family in it, and that's how yeah. they knew of it. Because yeah, you do, you don't hear about it in college. But um, I was an intern for Northwestern Mutual uh, in my sophomore year of college, and in order to do that, you have to get your A and H license through Kaplan. Okay. At the time, I was going to be a finance major, and I liked math, liked economics, stats, but I didn't really know where that would lead me. But the A&H classes through Kaplan, I just took to. I really enjoyed them. I Everything clicked pretty easily for me. And then when I'd come back to college and I was in an in, they had one insurance course in the finance degree, and it was like night and day. I mean, the, the, the level of, of coaching in Kaplan versus in, in the college setting. So I, I just learned a lot, loved it, took to it. And I said, you know, I think insurance is actually the route I want to go. Yeah. Then I went on through college. Uh, I studied abroad in Australia for six months, my senior year. And right when I got back, my dad had talked to a family friend at church and he had said, hey, we have an internship available within the accounting and claims department of our reinsurance brokering division. And this is at a company called Trion. Okay. And so I, I applied and got the job pretty quickly. So I finished out the last six months of college with an internship at Trion, uh, a bit remote and a bit in the office. And then just started full time like the day after I graduated. <laughs> so I, I did the accounting and claims uh, thing for probably about six months or so and very quickly realized I, I just like to talk too much. I, yeah. <laughs> the sales role is, is more my, my speed. So uh, there's a guy named Kyle Plath who's been in the reinsurance brokering space for a number of years. Um, he asked if I would come work with him on his accounts. So I, I had the fortune, honestly, 
of working alongside him, you know, day in, day out on all of his business for five years. And that really, I think, launched me into the reinsurance brokering space okay. because I had had the uh, the ability to kind of see everything alongside somebody who is quite seasoned. That's awesome. So yeah. you don't hear a lot of people studying insurance in college, and it doesn't sound like you did either, but you had some finance, you had some economics. Did that set you up for a career in insurance and reinsurance? No, <laughs> I would say, you know, it helped lead me to know what I don't do want to do and don't, right? I, yeah. I avoided communications classes like the plague, marketing classes, at the time just didn't intrigue me. So it at least kind of led me down the path to start to figure out what I do want to do. Yeah. But again, it was it was really the Kaplan classes outside of the college setting. That that's so um that's so interesting. I feel like I need to pair you up with somebody who I used to work with previously. She's an account manager who does a lot of selling. And I said, you need to get that producer's license. And then you can start making some real comp because you're really good at what you do. And she's scared out of her mind to study for that test. And I've been encouraging her for a couple of years. I think I need you to give her a pep talk. So yeah. I may pair you up with her. Yeah, it's not that hard. I mean, there are much uh, harder courses out there. Yeah. They make it so it's, I don't know what the pass rate is, but it's it's very doable. You yes. know, if you go you start to go through it and you're like, I hate the content. Like this doesn't resonate with me. I just, it's not clicking for me. Maybe reevaluate, but right. I think she'll find that she enjoys it more than she thinks. I think that's very cool that you found out early on what you don't like. And then you quickly figured out what you do like and were able to focus in on it. Uh, similarly for me, I'm an actuary by background, but I started my career in pension consulting, pension actuarial work which I would say is like 90% numbers and 10% client focused. And I was bored out of my mind. Like it just, it wasn't a good fit for me. Sure. And then when I got into healthcare specifically, like on the brokerage side, it quickly for me was like a 50% analytical, 50% client facing. And I just found that, you know, I was thriving on the, like the engagement with individuals. Uh, and that just kind of gave me like a spark to kind of push that forward. So I think it's really interesting that you figured out early on what you do like and what you don't like. Yeah, yeah it definitely helps along the way, right? Yeah. And so I take it you enjoy your work in the reinsurance industry. What's something about this career path that you really like? Yeah, it's had its moments, right? Ups and downs. So anyone that's new in the industry listening to this, it's not going to be sunshine and rainbows and fun and golf trips and whatnot every day, right? There's ups yeah. and downs to every industry. But I would say overall, if I look back over the last 13 years in it, it's, you know, like we talked about people, right? It's uh, I think there's a uniqueness in our industry of people value relationships across mm. the industry, not just within their company. You know, every company tries to create a good culture, but I think there's a general sense of like having good culture across our industry at conferences, more so than maybe some other industries. Um, so I think that's a really cool component. I would say the people too are very entrepreneurial. There's a ton yes. of just really smart entrepreneurial people that are looking at our our world and saying, where are the holes? How do we need to fill them? You know, what what issues do people have that maybe we can create a product around? One thing that we do a lot in our team is we'll get somebody that'll call us and say, hey, I have this unique product that's never been in the US market before. Can you help us create it? Can you mm -hmm. find the right markets to be able to file it and reinsurance companies to take the risk and administrators to administer it? And we, that's what we do, um, help, help them bring it to fruition. And so it's just really cool to see the people that are creating the future of our industry. It's just, it's yeah, ever evolving and entrepreneurial. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely agree. It's a very entrepreneurial place where people are with a bunch of puzzle pieces trying to solve a problem and yep. you get to play your role in, in the puzzle solving, right? Whether you're on the brokerage side or you're on the insurance or reinsurance side, um, or even if you're on the vendor side, there's there's just so many different opportunities 
that are part of solving these like gigantic puzzles. That I think I find to be very interesting about this career path. But you started off the answer by saying there's ups and downs. So tell me about the downs. What's something about this career path that maybe is not so great? I would say it's a fast paced industry we're in, right? There's always things going on. It's a busy, busy world to work in. Yeah. However, the biz, some of the business that we work on has a very long sales cycle. So you can spend a year launching a program and then a company can decide because they have a new CEO come in or they're acquired by a company or they just have a change of heart and they'll decide to fully get out of the line of business That's or right. you know, exit A&H as a whole. And all of a sudden you've spent a year working on something and poof, it's it's gone. <laughs> gone, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just sometimes it is what it is. It's the nature of the business. However, I would say that's one of the frustrating components is just not only how slow it is to, to get things done, but then how quickly um, that can also change and go in the other direction. You're reminding me, you're reminding me of a painful time in my career when I was doing business with an insurance company that had just gotten into stop loss maybe like three years prior to that. They, in like three or four years, grew from zero to almost $100 million, which was really fast. This is, you know, you're talking about uh, six, seven years ago. And they decided to exit the space because their goal was to be $500 million in five years. And looking back today, you'd probably say that's probably an unrealistic goal. But basically, snap of a finger, they decided this is not for us, exited the space, created a lot of turmoil, um, a lot of people issues, a lot of, you know, employment issues thereafter. So I, I feel your pain, like things can change on a dime. Oh, yeah. 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 We've all had those those stories for sure. And, you know, but it also keeps us employed, right? As, Absolutely. as a, a broker, at least it's our job then to pivot and say, okay, for our other partners that are left in the lurch, who do we bring in to be able to fill that gap? Um, sure. So some of it just, yeah, it's good and bad. Yeah, I'm curious on your outlook about this marketplace. Like if you look five or 10 years down the road, what's something that you see is like a really big opportunity or what's something that you see is like a really big risk to our industry? Oh, that's a good question. You know, alongside the, this is a, there's been a lot of policy changes recently. Um, you know, we're talking stop loss, but outside of stop loss recently, there's been a, a decent amount of change happening. Uh, and so policy changes, you know, very quickly you have a new administration and policy changes can t completely wipe out a product line to be yeah. viable for agents to sell. Um, and then all of the, the downline effects of that. Yeah. So policy changes for sure, stop loss and otherwise. This is a little controversial and a little, you know, outside of what we talk about in our industry, but I would say the health of our population is a concern mm. for me. Okay. Um, and what that means for claims going forward, right? We've had decent claim trends year over year in the stop loss yeah. space. We talk a lot about these really high cost claims, right? Gene and cell therapy. And these are all wonderful things, right? Like it's important to have advancements in our healthcare yeah. system. But my concern long term lies around kind of those underlying chronic diseases that we're seeing happen, metabolic dysfunction yes. in our in our country, um, obesity, like all of these things that are kind of downstream effects of our food system that we've created. Uh, so again, a little controversial, but I, I'm hoping that there's a more advocacy and understanding of what we put in our bodies and what we put on our bodies and what we surround ourselves with that will, you know, start to change that path. But right now we're, we're on a trajectory of, of a population that might live longer, but not live healthy years. Yeah. And, and that has a direct byproduct on claims. And we're sitting here in early May recording this, but just this week I saw that uh, CVS put out their earnings results, and basically the stock tanked like 20% in one day. Uh, CVS owns Aetna, and the big driver for the earnings was Aetna's insurance results. And basically their loss ratios were elevated by 6%, which that's a 
big swing that for a really large company to to miss at that level, yeah. it's it's pretty scary. And they said it's really driven by higher trends than they expected. So I think you're right on and it's impacting really big companies, which means it's going to also impact really small companies. You look at the stop loss space and the reinsurance space. These are companies that are much smaller than Aetna, CVS. So I do think that there's a lot of risks down the road. What about opportunities? What is something that you see as like an opportunity that keeps you kind of motivated in this space? You know, it's it's ever evolving, right? And I think stop loss is here to stay for for a number of years. But again, there's there's always new products too that that come online. And I, I feel like this is a really cool industry to work in because if if our economy changes, if we have a recession there's a shift that happens, right? There's always kind of this, this shifting. I feel like there's always uh, some new avenue that you can kind of go down and try and kind of recreate what, what you need to be doing in order to, to stay afloat as, as an individual, as a company, as a reinsurance entity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little recession proof. And I think that's really cool for us. Yeah. I think you're right on about that. We started the conversations talking about your women's networking group and you talked about the fellowship and having like a group of people. What about for you specifically? Like what about the role of mentorship? Has there been somebody in your career that's kind of guided you and helped you get to where you are today? You know, I kind of wish I would have established more of a, a clear mentor, right? It's, it's one thing to have a lot of good seasoned people around you, which I have. Um, but it's another thing to actually identify somebody as a mentor and have that yeah. clear understanding between each other. Um, and I wouldn't say I've done a good job of of doing that historically. However, I wouldn't be where I am today for sure without a handful of seasoned professionals in the space who, yeah. you know, I wouldn't say mentored me, you know, from a verbal perspective of, hey, you should do this and not this, or, mm. you know, this should be your next career move, but more so of taking me under their wing and saying, hey, I've got this event coming up, come with me. I think you would really enjoy me and the people that are going to be there. I think this would be a good opportunity for you. I mean, I was exposed to things that normally a 20, 25 year old at the time, I was able to be in a room with people who were decision makers and had been in it long enough to to really be experts in our world. Yeah. And so to be able to just be surrounded by those people, not just the connections, but to just learn from them and listen and understand how they they you know handle their relationships across the industry, what they're doing, how that connects with what other people are doing. I just yeah. I think I really benefited from people giving me the opportunity to be in the room with more seasoned professionals. Yeah, I think there's a difference between mentoring somebody and advocating for somebody. Sure. And yeah. to me, like mentorship is not only are you seeking counsel, but you also need to find somebody who's willing to kind of pull you up with them and take you to the big meeting or yeah. invite you to the event that allows you to have the exposure and learn, just kind of like organically learn, kind of take it all in and then put your brain to work, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I remember sitting at a Mayo Clinic meeting when I was 24 years old, sitting with the board and trying to understand how to get them into the stop loss space. And I was yeah. like, you know, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm here, I'm here yeah. and I'm learning. Right. So yeah, I've I've been felt very fortunate for that. I wouldn't be where I am today without those people bringing me along. So, That's yeah. great. That's great. So we're going to shift into some rapid fire questions. You ready for these? All right. So tell me three words that best describe a career in stop loss, self-funding and reinsurance. A fast pace, I would say transferable uh, and innovative. Okay. I like that. What about if you were to do this all over again and not pursue a career in insurance? What's a different career path you would have chosen? I'd be a matchmaker. I, uh, Tell me more about that. Yeah, uh, I would love to be a, a relationship matchmaker. Uh, you know, Match.com is out there. Yeah, There's a lot of professional 
matchmaking companies where there's an individual who's an expert and they help somebody who's struggling to find their match and, you know, really gets to know them and understand who they are, what their likes and dislikes are, and appropriately match them with somebody who's compatible. And I just yeah. I feel like I have a knack for it uh, a okay. bit. I've got a couple that's married. They have their third kid on the way. <laughs> um, I have a couple that have had long-term relationships. Some didn't work out. It's okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just, I find it to be a really exciting space. I love people and connecting people. I think you'll okay. probably find the theme of this is I generally just really like connecting humans, whether that be the women's trip, whether that be, you know, companies, B2B, yeah. um, or relationship matchmaking. So yeah, That's, that's really very good. cool. I like that. What about one of your passions outside of work? I would say health and wellness has become a really big passion of mine over the last 10, 15 years. It's something that I just, I really love learning more and more about and then implementing in my life and seeing the benefits from that. Um, a lot of health and wellness stuff. And then kind of alongside that reading is kind of a component of that. I love, I've gotten really big into reading. Yeah. Um, and then live music too. I just love some good live music. Very nice. Very nice. All right. So I'm going to ask you a controversial question now. Tell me your feelings about working from home in the context of somebody new entering our industry. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I mentioned, I think I got to where I am today by being in front of people um, mm. and working very closely with somebody who is seasoned. And it's really hard to do that remotely, but there's a lot of value to working remotely as well. So some sure. hybrid, I think, is probably the best route for somebody new, you know, a two to three days a week in the office. Alongside that, companies, I think, valuing spending the money for their new employees to get out and go to the conferences, some conferences at least, yeah. or some events. I think there's so much value in that. So even if you're only in the office one or two days a week, if you can kind of mix in those those travel and in-person events, I think they'll, they'll be okay. But yeah, it's, it's really hard yeah, to learn the puzzle pieces without it. Yeah, that's so true. You don't have to be in the office, but you have to be in a place where you can congregate with others and share ideas that that could be at a conference that could be, you know, all, all sorts of different places at, at the client's office. So it's not all about just being in the office, but it's about that in person interaction. Yeah, and I said this a, a long time ago, too, that I think people lose the the global understanding of where they fit into the market yes. and what their value is within it if they don't get out there. I think by going to a conference and seeing all the people and understanding the pieces and how they fit together, you're like, oh, okay, I'm valued because I bring this to the table. That's right. Versus if you're just sitting behind a desk at home and you're doing emails all day, you know, you, you're just not connecting your value to the company and the broader market as well. I, so I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. Yeah. So we're going to turn things around now, Laura. I'm going to give you a chance to ask me a question, anything you want to know about me. Sure. So I would say I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> all right. And, you know, part of being a broker is working across all A&H lines, working on all different types of deals. And so you, you kind of just become a little bit of a, a jack of all trades. And that's that has its pros and cons. Sure. So in your experience, or if you could go back to the beginning of your career, do you think there's more value in it for a, a young person starting getting really deep into one specific product line or, you know, niche within our industry and becoming the deep product expert? Or do you think there's more value in being a little bit more of a jack of all trades where you start to kind of touch a little bit of everything within our industry? And then, yeah. It's a really good question, and I think it depends on what you want to do in your career. I think if you want to be a strategist, then you can't be a mile deep. You have to be a mile wide and an inch deep. You have to know a lot of different things in order to be like a strategist and help navigate, um, and that ends up leading to like really good careers on the consulting and the brokerage side, right? But I think if you want to be a product expert, then you got to go deep. And I would tell you, for me, I, 
I feel like I'm a product expert. I feel like I'm a large claims expert. And I started specifically in stop loss on the retail brokerage side when I worked at Mercer. So I kind of learned the the needs of the employers uh, when it came to that product. And then from there, moved on to more of a enterprise level, relationship level with the stop loss carriers we were distributing through. And then I did a pivot and I moved into um, pure actuarial consulting. And when it went to Milliman, I really started focusing um, on actuarial consulting and management consulting to stop loss carriers. And then from there, I had an opportunity at Medical Risk Managers to be the underwriter of the product. And then from there, I went to BCS, where I kind of feel like now I'm working on my PhD, my dissertation in um, large claims. And so I feel like for me, I've been able to go deep at, at every place I've been. I've been able to go like one layer deeper. And that for me has really helped with like my content expertise. And then that translates to ability to like create product, ability to like consult on product. So I, I, I definitely feel like there's an advantage to being like a mile deep. However, yeah. there's also a lot of risk if you do that, because you don't know if that product you're in or that expertise you have, if it's going to sustain for like the long haul. So yeah. you definitely take that risk on if you decide to go really deep into something. I was very lucky in my career that I was bored out of my mind as a pension actuary, and I found a path in, in healthcare actuarial work. And then over time, that led into like stop loss and reinsurance. But I had I not made that move, I don't think I could be as deep because the pension space has really disappeared here in the past 15 years. Like you don't see a lot of companies offering up pensions today. So yeah. that is a risk you take. If you want to go deep in something, you better think long and hard about it because it might not be a, an industry or a product that sustains like the test of time. And so if that ends up happening, you have to figure out like how with your knowledge you have, you're going to now make a pivot. Right. So I think that becomes harder because after some time in your career, especially if you're deep, you're going to get typecasted as, OK, that's a stop loss guy you, that they're not going to be able to work on long term care or they're not going to be able to work on disability. So I just think that that's something that people need to think about as they go further in their career. Yeah, you have to balance for sure. Absolutely. Well, so let's close it up, Laura, with this one last question. Just give our audience one piece of advice uh, for somebody new who's getting started in our industry. What's one piece of advice you would give them? You know, I, I was hesitant to, to put this down, but blind confidence. I think you need to go in with a little bit of blind confidence and know that you're going to figure it out, right? Uh it's an intimidating space to come into as a young individual because there are so many experienced older individuals in this space. Right? Sure. And so you can kind of look around and you go, Oh my gosh, you know, I've such a long way to go to get to where they're at. And, you know, how is somebody going to take me seriously over this person? And so it's something I'm even still, you know, working on is just keeping that confidence about yourself knowing your, knowing your, your value, um, your ability to, to learn quickly and yeah. provide, yeah, provide value in what you're doing. Um, but then you know, you're also not feeling like you need to fit into a mold, like just remembering it, you do start to see a mold, but you don't need to fit into it, you know, be yourself, sure. you know, show your personality. Um, being authentic goes a long way, right? Like just, and if I could go back in time, I think I would try and do that myself, not, not try and fit into a mold as much and just really letting who I am shine and not worrying so much about how that translates um, in the industry. So yeah, be, be yourself, whether that's even what you dress like at the conferences, yeah. you want to dress professional, but if you have some cool style outside of, of the industry, bring a flair of that in. I think yeah. you're more memorable that way. Absolutely. I like that advice and we'll close it up there for today, Laura. Thanks for being a guest with us on Firm and Final. Thanks for having me, man. This is great. All right. We'll let you go. Take care. Take care.